Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think we'll get going now. I'm sure some more people will trickle in. Um, I'm Angela Stent. I'm director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. And I would like to warmly welcome you to the 24th Navai Nal Lecture. Um, let me just say a few words about this lecture series. Um, it was endowed through a generous gift from the Alfred Friendly Foundation. Uh, and it was endowed in honor of David Nell, who was executive director of the Alfred Friendly Press Fellowship Program from 1983 to 1992. And it's intended, the series of lectures is intended to foster public and academic interest in Central Asia, uh, and particularly to encourage the work of younger scholars uh, in this field of study. And we've had a very distinguished group of people who have lectured in these series. Um, and let me just say a few words about uh, Mr. Navai, um, uh, uh, for whom uh, a long time ago the lecture series is named. Uh, he was born in 1441 in Herat in Afghanistan. He died in 1501. Uh, he came from an aristocratic military family. Uh, he studied in Herat and he held a number of offices in the court, so he really was an aristocrat. He was also a member of a dervish order, uh, and he studied uh, poetry very intensively uh, with the renowned uh, Persian poet Jami, uh, and he uh, read the works of great mystics. And so in the latter part of his life, after his service at court and, uh, uh, and uh, all of the other things he did, um, he turned his life to poetry and scholarship, uh, he wrote first in Persian, and then in, and I know I'm not, not going to pronounce this properly, Chagatag, probably. Um, he wrote, he left four great divans, or collections of poetry be, be, belonging to the different phases of his life, and he wrote five romances based on conventional themes in Islamic literature. So he was a great poet writer. Um, and now I would like to introduce, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Regine Spector, who is an uh, assistant professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Her research and, re and teaching interests include topics uh, in political economy, development, energy politics, and central Eurasian studies. Um, she's had a Title VIII Research Fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. She holds a PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA and an MA in international relations and international policy studies from Stanford University. Uh, and her research has appeared in problems of post-communism, post-Soviet affairs, Central Asian Survey, and the Washington Quarterly, and she is currently working on a book, the subject of which I think she will discuss with you tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Eugene Spector. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be here this evening. Thank you, Angela and Ben, Christina, and the rest of the team here for the invitation and that very warm opening uh, reception remark. Um, I'm going to speak to you tonight about business in Central Asia. And this talk is indeed based on my book manuscript, Securing Property Without Rights, Politics, Social Relations, and Bazaars in Central Asia. Now, looking at national level aggregate indicators, you would see that doing business in Central Asia is challenging, and in fact, ranks among the most difficult and challenging in the world. Take Kyrgyzstan, for example. This country is ranked 171 out of 183 in terms of the ease of doing business. Um, and that's from 2012. There's constant discourse around property redistributions, property struggles related to business, and um, also including foreign investors. Yet my interest in this question and this topic was sparked by my own experience living in Central Asia, which belies these national level aggregate indicators. There are individuals who I have known personally or who I have followed for over a decade now who have thriving businesses despite a range of economic crises, despite significant political turmoil, or international crises. Let me just give you a quick example from one of the biggest wholesale bazaars in Kyrgyzstan, Dordoi Bazaar. Throughout the 90s and 2000s, this bazaar has been buzzing with commercial activity, it's been growing, and the main founder and owner of this bazaar has remained the same over the past two decades now, almost 25 years, in fact. So how can we understand, first of all, the emergence of bazaars as such an important foundation for Kyrgyzstan's economy, 
Um, why has this bizarre door though have been, been relatively stable over time? And what are these implications for pockets of stability in business and property for not only Kyrgyzstan's economy, but also for understanding politics in the region and for the study of property relations more generally? Um, I will answer and talk about these questions over the next 30 to 40 minutes. So let me first speak about bazaars more generally. Um, and again, I'm going to focus on Kyrgyzstan here. Now, there are lots of wholesale bazaars in Central Asia, and many of the uh, most important are, in fact, located in Kyrgyzstan. You have significant um, bazaars both in the north and the south of the country where goods made primarily in China are resold throughout Central Asia and also to countries to the north, for example, Russia and Kazakhstan. Now, the fact that Kyrgyzstan is such an important trading country is not what you might expect given the history of the region. In fact, I was at a dinner with some senior diplomats a couple of years ago from the Caucasus, from Georgia and Azerbaijan. And I was, um, one official expressed real surprise when I mentioned that my field research site involved bazaars in Kyrgyzstan. The premise that bazaars in Kyrgyzstan could be important and interesting clashed with his own historical understanding of the region. He inquired, perplexed, aren't bazaars in Central Asia prominent among the settled peoples, like the Uzbeks? Um, my answer surprised him. While indeed bazaars thrived along the Silk Road cities of Samarkand, Bukhara, cities in contemporary Uzbekistan, and in fact they still exist, the biggest bazaars in Central Asia are now located in Kyrgyzstan. After the first decade of independence, Kyrgyzstan had really earned a reputation as a trading state and as a country of traders, as many newspapers of the time would recount. So from this perspective, the fact that Kyrgyzstan has become such an important trading hub is, is indeed a puzzle given these historic patterns and foundations. Um, the nomadic peoples, such as Kyrgyz and Kazakhs, um, had a role in local trade, um, and, and we could talk more about that, but they were neither dominant nor associated with bizarre trade or culture. Now, the standard narrative from an economist perspective for the rise of bazaars and trade in Kyrgyzstan would rely on the basic principles of supply and demand. So that after the Soviet Union's collapse, bazaars and traders were able to operate freely again after the collapse of the command economy. And that the growth and rise of this sector, as you would read in the 90s um, at the time that a significant World Bank and other publications were coming out, this was in fact a natural or expected occurrence. And indeed, um, by the end of the Soviet period, there was a significant literature on farmers markets, Kalhoz Nirinki, and they were kind of dubbed as the centers of the second economy, right, in um, which goods were trade more or less based on free market principles, whether extra goods produced on your own plot uh, or genes that someone had gotten from the West, right, were kind of traded or exchanged under the table. And so with the collapse of the Soviet Union, according to this narrative, the emergence of bazaars and the thriving of bazaars is in fact the freeing of the market and the natural instinct to truck, barter, and trade emerging in Central Asia. So instead of these two perspectives, this kind of cultural perspective or this economically determined perspective, what I'd like to do is focus on a different dimension. Um, and again, out of my observations, spending some time in bazaars, and talking with both traders and, and others associated with that sector. And that is the rise of bazaars and trade was not a natural process. It was born out of struggle, crisis, and loss as much as opportunity and inevitability. And in order to tell this narrative, what I want to do is focus first on the meanings and understandings of trade in Kyrgyzstan, really among the ethnic Kyrgyz in particular. Um, so as I mentioned, the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s really renewed a discussion in the popular culture about the meaning of new professions and especially the meaning and appropriate role of ethnic Kyrgyz in trade. So let me give you a couple newspaper clips from the time to give you a sense of what was being written. Quote, you might know that during Soviet times it was almost impossible to get a poor Kyrgyz to the bazaar, even if you would dra drag him by a tractor. To be labeled as a trader or speculator was more humiliating than to be shot by a gun. Um, another pro proverb goes like this. He who lives near the market will never be rich. The implication being that Kyrgyz spend their money at the bazaar. It's not an opportunity, it's rather a liability. So 
the economic transition that ensued in Kyrgyzstan, um, some have written in the context of broader shock therapy and liberalization programs, mani manifests itself very much as a poverty shock for many people. Many Soviet-era intellectuals and professionals, from doctors, accountants, lawyers, teachers, ended up at the bazaar to survive. Um, and so bazaars in the 90s became associated with survival as much as economic opportunity. Um, over the course of the 90s, however, this perception began to change. Traders, bazaar directors, journalists began to question this traditional understanding about the appropriateness of ethnic Kyrgyz as traders. They would write, for example, quote, Kyrgyz have never been traders. They were only buyers who would spend all their money at the market. But nowadays, the picture is changing. Everyone who lives nearby the market is becoming richer. Now, indeed, many people did become more wealthy through bazaar activities. They were able to buy cars, buy apartments, um, fund education for their children. But yet, many also conveyed to me a sense of loss through this process. So while they were able to buy cars, while they were able to uh, maybe take a vacation, they lost some aspect of their culture. They lost their profession as teachers. They lost their um, intellectual core. And, and this is not only the case for ethnic Russians who lived in Bishkek, for example, but also expressed among Kyrgyz as well. And so th the perceptions of this role of traders was, was very much in flux during this period. For others, though, and especially, I think, among the younger generation today, it's become extremely prestigious to be a trader in a bazaar. If you say you own a container and work in bazaar trade, you have a status symbol associated with that. And when I say container here, a little bit later, I'll show a brief segment of a, docu of a set of pictures that I took. But over time, these wholesale bazaars became containerized, meaning shipping containers were brought in and stacked next to each other and double stacked as both storage areas and also storefronts for sellers. These containers, in the, in the height of the trade, could be sold for more than apartment, you know, tens and tens of thousands of dollars. You open up the for sale signs in the local Bishkek newspapers and you see container for sale, the row, you know, $80,000. And so it became a, a significant status symbol to have a container or to be in a certain row um, with a high uh, prahidimos, like a passersby. Um, so in, instead of assuming that it's kind of natural to truck, barter, and trade, what I'm suggesting is we look at these changing meanings of trade and society over, over time. I also found that it's really important to look at power and hierarchy at the bazaar. And, and again, these dimensions are missing from both cultural interpretations of bazaars that might focus on the nature of bargaining or the nature of information flows between sellers and buyers. This is like Geertz and some of the tra traditional anthropological literature on bazaars. And it's also missing from neoliberal economic perspectives that focus on the rise of trade and some of the other policy dimensions of, of, the f of relatively free trade in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and, and so, you know, when you think about the bazaar, you, you walk in and there are traders everywhere. Well, I quickly learned that this question of who owns the bazaar is crucial in these Central Asian countries. You see the traders, you don't see the owners. Um, but they, these owners, lay claim to the physical land on which bazaars rest. And they set the terms for the collection of various fees. Fees for rental, fees for um, stalls, fees for a space in a pavilion, fees for a container, and other pieces of physical property at the bazaar. In other words, the traders are paying the owners rent and other fees in order to trade there. Now, what I'm not going to be talking about is the fees that traders pay, let's say, to the government officials um, in the form of a tax or a license. There is that as well. Um, I'm really going to be focusing on this, the owners. And this question of who owns the bazaar opened up an entire window, an entire door for me to think about issues of hierarchy and power at, in the bazaar. In particular, it allows us to see the dynamics of, of extraction by a, a particular few from the majority in society or a significant subset of, of the working uh, world in these countries, and in particular in Kyrgyzstan. And it's not the traders who have power or leverage in politics, but these owners of the land on which bazaars rest. Basically, if you own bazaar land, you own a significant portion of the economy in Kyrgyzstan. 
Now, it might sound strange to say that because when we hear Kyrgyzstan in the news, we think of gold mining. And maybe we think of remittances too. There are significant labor migrants in Kazakhstan, from Kyrgyzstan working in Kazakhstan and in Russia, and they send back one or two billion dollars a year, right, in remittances. But if you look at bazaar turnover, and just even take some of the biggest wholesale bazaars, annual turnover at that, those bazaars, especially in the late 2000s, for example, the numbers I have, are hundreds of millions of dollars a month, right? And so when you aggregate that, there's huge amounts of money circulating in these bazaars. So <clears throat> who are these owners? That was a question that I tried to wrestle with in Central Asia. It was very interesting. Um, I, I actually have a piece where I wrote about this in Kazakhstan where it was much more difficult to ascertain ownership structures. In Kyrgyzstan, it's a little more transparent. Um, but let me tell you who they're not. They're not directly members of presidential families. So here in Kyrgyzstan, I'm thinking of President Akayev or President Bakiev and his family. Those families controlled significant assets in the countries, whether cell phone companies, grocery stores. But bazaars were not considered part of the presidential family business, and they were, in fact, noticeably absent from discussions about the presidential family business. And in fact, what I found is that the liberalization of trade in these countries, in this country in particular, um, actually has been one of the main sources of relatively independent wealth in Kyrgyzstan that's not associated with these um, elite leaders. So they're not members of the presidential family. They're also not determined by clan, ethnicity, or other ascriptive characteristics. That is to say, they're not people who are a clan member of one of the family members, or not exclusively ethnic Kyrgyz, for example. You had Uzbek bazaar owners and Kyrgyz as, as well as, for example, um, a Uyghur now, very prominent owner of uh, the Medina bazaar. And so this is not what we might expect, given significant literature on these different um, identity dimensions of, of Central Asia. And what I find is that, in fact, Central Asia looks much more like other post-Soviet countries in terms of who came, came to control and own these bazaars. They were from the nomenklatura of the Soviet era. They were sportsmen turns bandits turns businessmen. And there were existing kolkhoz directors as well who were in charge of the kolkhoz nirinki. And so these socially determined Soviet era groups um, turned out to be among the main groups struggling for control over bazaars in the 90s. And so the book manuscript of which this presentation is a part really tries to address each of these groups of owners, how they acquired property, and some of the struggles that ensued in the 90s. Um, and I'm going to bracket um, my discussion of the sportsmen turns bandits turns businessmen and also the kolhoz directors and kind of focus on the nomenclatura example just for the in the context of this talk. So they come to control these bazaars but the question is how do they secure them over time? 25 years is a long time in this region of the world to keep control, right? Given all, all of the things I'll talk about. Um, so let's take a moment to think about property security, right? When we think about how property is secured, and this is in the context of the developing world where rule of law institutions are often weak, you can't rely necessarily on the courts or on um, an objective set of enforcement institutions, you might, you might think, okay, well, they pay to play. They bribe, right? Um, that was an example uh, and a common narrative that seemed to come up in my time in Central Asia. Um, that is, they bribe the executive, they bribe other government officials. And what I think is that this perspective overstates, in fact, the power of the president and other elites and underplays the range of strategies and tactics that business people use in this region. And I'll talk about some of them in a minute. They amass broad support, they use select protests, they use negotiation, they become members of parliament and engage in politics themselves. Um, but before I go into that, let me just give you a second conventional narrative. Sportsmen turn bandits turn businessmen, right? That they use violence or the threat of violence to acquire property and control it over time. Now, that's indeed true. So I don't want to say that that's not an important phenomenon in the region, but it's not the whole story. Why is it then that these sportsmen turns bandits turns businessmen um, form patronage bar bargains, have broad support, have um, become elected 
MPs, right? That is to say, it's not just about resorting to guns and violence. We miss a broader set of social and political dynamics by just focusing on these conventional narratives. And my general argument is that the people in this region who have been able to be successful draw upon a range of relationships at multiple levels of politics and society to secure their property. This is a perspective that takes individual action and agency seriously. That is to say, there are structural con constraints and there are various systems and um, uh, bigger picture pressures, but they, that there is agency for these individuals to um, embed themselves in political and social relationships actively, to foster them, to create them, and that these are in fact substitutes for law in this region. So let me now return to bazaar owners and give you an example from this Dorloi Bazaar that I mentioned, a big wholesale bazaar outside of the capital city, Bishkek, in Kyrgyzstan. It's grown to be one of the largest bazaars in the country and in the region. It can employ anywhere from 10 to 30,000 people, depending on the season and the year and when you're looking. It's really a city in, within a city. And there's been one main owner of this bazaar for the past 25 years, Askar Salambekov and his family. Now, if you look back to Salambeko's biography, he was part of the Komsomol. He was in the Soviet Youth Party, and he was w among the rising nomenclatura of the time when the Soviet Union collapsed. He began the bazaar in the early 1990s. Um, there's an interesting quote that I don't have, but he talks about how strange it was that he was starting the bazaar at this time. Why didn't he go into some other profession or become a lawyer or do something else? But in fact, he uh, was in the right place at the right time in the municipal B Bishkek city administration, and, and so he pursued this bazaar. Um, again, I'm not really going to focus as much on how he built the bazaar, I'm going to focus on three different strategies and practices that I observed that he's created and fostered over the last 20 years. The first is, and, and here the point is that it's not enough to say, oh, he's nomenclatura, so that's why he's been successful over the past 25 years. Because there are examples of people who are in the nomenclatura who haven't been as successful. So what we really have to look at is these Act, actions and practices and strategies that have emerged. And the first is flexibility and adaptability. Um, he himself has recounted in a series of interviews that um, the threat is significant. The threat from other family members, other business members um, who seek to gain control over his business empire are significant. And let me give you a quote. Many officials, including from the highest echelons of power, look at the success of, of my company with a certain amount of envy. They attempted to get into our business, to take it over. We had to make diplomatic moves to keep out of our business. Sometimes you have to fight hard negotiations. You have to be flexible. You need to know when to negotiate. You have to take into consideration hundreds of factors. There's so much to know, when to compromise, when to not, when to not compromise. Danger is everywhere, left and right. You have to maneuver. So this is the language that he uses himself when he's describing the process of, of trying to maintain control over this bazaar and other bazaars and property that, and business assets that he's built over the past 20 years. So this constant flexible adaptation, I think, is characteristic of successful owners. The second is he's actively sought political power. At first, this came through a form of patronage relationships, for example, with President Oskar Akayev, the first president. For example, he was appointed uh, governor of Narin, which is an oblast in Kyrgyzstan. But over time, he consolidated his standing um, and became a national deputy in the parliament, which he's been off and on since 2005. And the argument is the extension of these political ties at local levels as well as national levels forges political support for his business to fend off expropriation and predation. Now here, there are some really interesting quotes about what it is about political office that helps his business. So he says, quote, if you're a civil servant, you can be fired at any time, right? The logic here is that you can also get wealthy through these positions in government, but they, you're also at the behest of the leadership if they want to get rid of you or fire you, right? He says, this, is not, this does not happen if you're a member of parliament. The parliament is a place of confrontation between different lobbies, and we need to be a part of it to defend our economic interests, he says. Oh, this is actually not him. This is one of his employees. My candidate is interested in the immunity given by his status as well to protect his private business. So the implication here is that whether or not things are law lawful in terms of what's happening, the parliament provides the 
protection to continue um, to take part in these lobbies and negotiations. So he says, others have told me, quote, businessmen are going into politics to protect their interests. If you're a deputy, no one would ever think about trying to get your property. So Salman Bekov is one example, but if you look at the business and b the bazaar owners in Kyrgyzstan from the late 2000s, you will find that many of them are MPs. So I took various MP lists, and in the 2006 parliament, for example, which is a little bit smaller than the current parliament, you have 30% of the deputies having either direct or indirect ties to these bazaars, um, and all sorts of bazaars, not just the main ones, um, some of the smaller wholesale bazaars as well. If you take the 10 richest people in Kyrgyzstan's parliament in 2008, um, you will find that five of them are bazaar owners. So the point here is that Salman Bekov is, is one of quite a few of these, of these individuals and that the active um, engagement in politics is considered crucial. Third and finally, he has formed individuals with a variety of social groups. And here, we have to look at how these business people build local support. He's acquired a reputation of looking after his people. So as we know, the poverty rates in the rural areas are very high. Let me just give you a quick sense of all the things that he's done. He's built art centers, community um, uh, movie theaters, held exhibitions of artists, built cafes, built mosques, <laughs> funded um, schools, sports teams, journalists training. Um, he's given to farmers. He's helped build a railroad, right? I mean, this is, a, this is a lot that he's done, especially at the local level. He also employs people. So when I went to Dorle Bazaar, I would start to ask, okay, mm, so who are, who are some of the employees here? Who are the controllers, the people who collect money? They would say, oh, I you know Atbashinsky or Narinsky. That means people from his region. Or I interviewed someone who, in fact, works for um, the U.S. Embassy, a local Bishkek person, and he said he got married at Koitash, which actually is also a hotel owned by Salman Bekov, and they said, oh, yeah, all the wait staff, all the people there are at Bashinsky. So this idea that he's supported his own, he provides um, jobs, and, and he talks about this in his interviews, right, that, he, that, that he's helping amidst this massive socioeconomic um, struggle that the majority of the population is facing. And these social networks really matter, I think, because as he himself mentioned, and as we can document multiple times over the past couple of decades, there have been significant threats to property, whether it's after Akayev, after Bikiev, and points in between. Um, there have been many, many local level protests, and the protests are means that businessmen use to draw red lines in the sand to say, um, let's project our power, let's stop the expropriation of property. I think a lot of attention has gone to the 2005 and 2010 events in Kyrgyzstan where the two respective leaders were overthrown, but there's a whole series of protests as well in 2006, 2007, um, and 2008 that I document that did not result in the overthrow of the president, for example, but that were very much revolving around these issues of business and who controls what. Um, and so while there, there wasn't, a, let's say, a regime change or an overthrow, what you actually saw was continuity in business relations, which was actually the goal of the protest itself. So the point here is that we really need to look at these strategies, whether it's protest, politics, um, behind the scenes negotiations and adaptations to understand property security in the region. And that to simply pay someone off or to use violence is, um, is, is essentially an oversimplification. Now, why does this matter? And so here now I'm going to move into the three implications for this type of thinking um, and I'm going to start with um, what this means uh, a little bit more theoretically for the study of property. Um, so I began the talk with a way to conceptualize bazaars that takes seriously really what people understand trade means, um, how meanings of professions are changing over time, and how power and hi hierarchy are fundamentally at work in, in the context of the bazaar. Against the backdrop of this rapid liberalization and privatization, different groups 
of, of which I've talked about, have gained control over this bazaar property. And I've focused on the way that bazaar owners can secure this property um, in really, really challenging situations, right, where you have political upheaval, economic instability, as well as um, other forms of financial crisis and ethnic crisis, of violence. So the first implication is about property and property rights in the developing world. In the absence of formal rule of law institutions that function the way we would hope or imagine, what I'd like to suggest is it's not all out chaos. And it's not about violence or bribes. There are in fact these strategies that they use and there are pockets of stability and property security in the region. Now the implications of this finding might depend on what your normative goals are. This form of property security and stability may not be ideal, but it does have its benefits. So in the case of Kyrgyzstan, if you take Dordoloi Bazaar, property relations have been relatively stable and the bazaar has been growing throughout the 90s and 2000s. I have some evidence to suggest that predation, so the ways in which traders um, need to give bribes to various government officials, for example, is very low at Dordoi compared to other bazaars. Um, and that as I'll talk about, many different types of businesses and, and sectors have emerged because of the stability of this bazaar. I think theoretically this has implications for property rights. Um, we know the case of China, which developed very rapidly early on in its reform, not because of private property rights and um, per se, but because of predictability and property relations predictability and stability in property relations. So I would argue that many types of businesses and sectors have emerged in Kyrgyzstan precisely because of that relative stability. Now on the other hand, if you want to see a world in which businessmen don't have to engage in politics and don't have to form all of these social relations and constantly reforge them in order to survive, then the outcome may indeed be suboptimal. Either way, however, what I'm suggesting is that, is that these strategies and relationships really matter. Now the second implication is for understanding politics in Kyrgyzstan. I've recently been reading the work of Julia Adams, who is a historian of Dutch and European history. So you might be thinking to yourself, why? <laughs> well, she's writing about states in early modern Europe, and she calls them familial states. What does she mean by that? She says they are, quote, elite family packs and contracts for passing down and sharing state office and political economic privilege. So she's talking about Dutch merchants and the ways in which their families are embedded in multiple nodes of power. And that they have come to control the state and had a decisive say over future political arrangements in, and policy. Um, she says, quote, there are multiple sovereign centers in the Netherlands at this time which were each colonized by elite family members and the heads of these families bent on pursuing patriarchal projects that were part and parcel of their family's survival as players in patrimonial systems. What I'm going to suggest is this actually has remarkable salience in Kyrgyzstan today. The practices and relations that bazaar owners have used that I've talked about may be resulting in a reconfiguration of the state along the lines that Adams conceptualizes. In the literature, Kyrgyzstan is often called a predatory state, referring to the predatory nature either of the bureaucrats who are extracting from the citizens or the presidential family itself that threatens business. And without denying these trends, I'm suggesting that we think a little bit differently by looking at these bazaar owners and businessmen about the state. So let's take Salambekov. It's not just Salambekov. Yes, he's the owner of the bazaar, but if you look at his entire family, you see that his family members have a variety of positions in business and politics. His, his, he was a member of parliament, he's no longer, but his brother has been a member of parliament since 2005. His brother's son has been a member of the Bishkek city legislature, and multiple other members of the family, including other sons, have different positions in the business that they're in. As one analyst commented, Salambekov has succeeded because of his smart strategies, quote unquote. That is, not only is he rich and member of parliament, but he's put his relatives and people in every position in business and politics, unquote. And not all of this happened overnight, of course. He built this set of political and business relations over the course of a decade. And the Salambekov family is also not alone. There are many examples of multiple family 
generations of family members in politics now in Kyrgyzstan. Again, if you look at the 2007-2010 parliaments, you can see some of this continuity emerging. In addition, there are continuities in, continuities in political power across um, mem across government positions. So again, in the case of Kyrgyzstan, you look at members of parliament and you look at their members, uh, their relatives in other government positions, for example, in ministerial positions. There are dozens of examples of MPs who are actually overseeing their relatives in a ministerial position, what might be termed a conflict of interest, but what I would suggest is a f set of relationships emerging um, and a set of nodes of power emerging that are constituting the state in Kyrgyzstan. This issue has become incredibly p politically salient. In fact, there was an attempt for a draft law to disclose political relationships among government officials in 2012, and that law would have required any political or state official to submit information on relatives working in the government or other positions. You can imagine the bill stalled and failed in 2012, unsurprisingly. So Adams has multiple centuries of historical data to work with. Um, and admittedly, Kyrgyzstan's independent history is only 20 or 25 years young. But by tracing these bazaar owners and thinking about them as families um, and looking a little bit more broadly, I th I'm making the tentative claim that these property claims are beginning to, be, to operate based on family lineage and dynamics across generations and that they are secured via state positions over time. I think this has significant policy implications. For example, if you look at the recent debate on the customs union, um, you might be able to kind of understand how this, wor this works. I, I can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A if you'd like, but I'd like to move to the third point now on implications for understanding the economy. Again, the presumption in the literature about the importance of stable property rights is that by having stable property rights, you get more foreign direct investment, right? People are willing to invest in your country if there's stability, if people know that the contracts are going to be upheld and there's going to be um, profits <laughs> from your investment. I think for bazaars, we need to think a little bit differently about the implications of proper s property security in these pockets of property security. The relevant measure here may not be FDI, foreign direct investment. It may be the stable conditions for networks of trading relationships to become established and to evolve over time. Indeed, um, there have been massive political um, and economic ins versions of instability, but Dordoy has become a crucial hub for business. Um, I was rereading articles from 2005, 2007, 2010, and all of them proclaimed the death of Dordoy. Well, I was just there this past summer, and Dordoy is still there. So, um, in fact, new sectors are becoming, are emerging. Um, I'm not going to talk about all the other services that are there, but most interesting to me is a burgeoning apparel sector, a made in Kyrgyzstan um, sector that. Um, is essentially located at Dordoy. So about 100 to 150,000 people in Bishkek are involved in the sewing sector. Um, while in the 90s it was all of Bishkek trades, now it's all of Bishkek sews. So these apparel producing shops are scattered throughout the city. Some of them do operate near the bazaar. Um, but what's really interesting is many of the locals who work at these shops and who open these apparel producing shops traded at Dordoy, over 50%, upwards of 60%, according, according to a survey I've done recently. And many have really good ties with either suppliers or um, clients in other countries because most of these goods that are made in Kyrgyzstan are made with inputs from China, so fabrics, buttons, all the little frills from China, but they're resold or they're sold in Kazakhstan and Russia, 90% for example of all apparel made in Kyrgyzstan is sold in Russia and Kazakhstan. So they're using their knowledge of trade relations, their knowledge of the way these um, trade networks work between China, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan and Russia to successfully create essentially this export industry. 
So the stability of property relations has, in a certain sense, allowed for domestic capital accumulation and the reassemblage of uh, industrial production. What I mean by this is people are using their own money to start these sewing businesses, th their own money from the trade. There, there are some that do take out microcredit. Um, and many of them are actually setting up shops in old Soviet combines or factories that have largely died or closed. So the fact that we don't see strong business indicators at the national level um, does not imply that business is absent or business or property stability is absent. In fact, some have actually said to me in a set of conversations this past summer that precisely the stability and the rise of the sector is due to the absence of foreign direct investment, the absence of outside intervention um, that has allowed the sector to emerge from the bottom up and grow and flourish. Um, here the point is that when we think of textile and apparel manufacturing today, we think of H&M or the gap, right, that um, pours money into factories in Bangladesh or Southeast Asia or Mexico or wherever um, to produce shirts that are then sold at gap stores. These producers are not linked to those global commodity chains or to that type of investment. So, Again, you could argue that the system I've described is based on massive inequalities and these power dynamics between the owners and the traders. Yet, in some ways, their interests are very aligned. They are interested in the continuation of the bazaar, um, the ability for both the traders as well as now the producers to continue to make money, to continue to redefine what it means to be a business owner, to be an entrepreneur, to be a producer. And in fact, at, in addition to being maybe um, to be to having a prestige around a, tra a trading container, it is now extremely prestigious to be a designer at an apparel shop. You know, if you're if you're a designer, somehow for whatever reason, that's the thing to be right now. Um, the owner of a sewing shop and and the sewer itself, um, so actually surprisingly prestigious. Um, from our survey, but we need to unpack that a little bit more. Um, so again, I've, I've now embarked on this project to better understand the apparel sector with Isil Kanbatoyeva at Brown University. And we're looking at this as an example of family-based industrial production in a region widely believed to have deindustrialized or decayed over the last decade. And for those of you following the Olympics, I'll leave you with one fun fact. The recent silver medalists in figure skating from Russia who wore costumes, well, they were designed by a prominent producer of high-end apparel from Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. So Iselkin and I have an article in the most recent issue of Central Asian Survey that discusses these niche apparel producers and the Soviet origins of their education and their skills that are being re-employed today. So I'll end with that thought. I uh, thank you, and I look forward to your questions and the discussion that now follows. <laughs> so I'm happy to take questions, but should I run this, or would you like uh, to? Maybe. Uh, so you'd like to run uh -huh. some pictures of the bazaar while you're taking the questions, right? We can do that. Yeah, I think that's sure. is that yeah. is that okay? That's good. Okay, that's very good. So thank mm -hmm. you very much, sure. and I'm going to ask you the first question. Now. I'd like you to talk more about the customs union and what would be the implications for all this very interesting system <laughs> that you have described if, mm. if and when I get mm -hmm. it. Okay, great. So yes, the question is, is indeed on the, the customs union. I, I've been thinking about this a lot, in fact. Um, I can't say I have the definitive answer, but let me give you some of, of, of my thoughts because this is also not a new question. Right. The, quest, the Treaty for the Customs Union between Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus was signed in 2007 and, and came into being in 2010. And in fact, Kyrgyzstan said that it would like to join in 2011, and that's already two or three years ago. But they keep delaying. They keep punting the can down the road, right? Um, I think initially it was proclaimed to be very good for Kyrgyzstan to be integrated with its especially northern neighbors. But over time, more and more analysts, and I will also suggest political and business interests, have come to realize that Kyrgyz tariffs are very, very low now. And in fact, becoming part of the customs unions will raise those tariffs. 
Um, so if the average tariff rate is now 5%, some say it will double under the customs union. Now, for a re-export sector, um, that's very damaging, and the re-export sector is the bazaar. Um, so uh, others are going to say, others are saying that consumer prices are going to rise because uh, prices are, are going to increase. Now, some say that, that, that this actually might benefit the sewing sector because made in Kyrgyzstan will mean that you don't have to pay tariffs if you export to Kazakhstan or Russia, and that makes sense. However, you also have to remember that they would be importing from China, and those rates would go up. There were a number of sewing producers I talked to this summer, especially some, a couple of very high-profile, prominent producers who are very concerned about certification. And there's a particular bureaucratic regulatory dimension here, which is that a lot of the goods made in Kyrgyzstan now um, go through Biet Cargo and other cargo companies, and, and they might have their own label or they might have this general label made in Kyrgyzstan, but they're not officially certified. And so to the extent that those goods no longer get accepted, for example, into Russia, the producers are extremely, extremely nervous that it will actually have a very negative impact on, on their very, very successful apparel producing stores now. So there's a lot of talk um, in LegProm, which is the association, the light industry association, for, the, for both the association and the government or some combination to certify and create a bureaucratic process through which these goods will legitimately continue to be imported into Russia. I think along these lines, um, not to belabor this point, but spe speaking specifically, I've read recently that um, there are a set of negotiations underway for there to be special free trade zones for Dordoy, Medina, and Karasu Bazaar, which are the three main bazaars in the country, for seven years, so that the bazaars don't die overnight. And I've also read that Kazakhstan is adamantly against this, although I also read Nargis um, Kasinova has a very great piece on the impact of the customs union on the Kazakh um, economy. She argues that there were actually special provisions for them, um, but, but for whatever reason, Nazarbayev is now saying that, that he doesn't want any special provisions for Kyrgyzstan. Um, there have also been a set of protests around joining the customs union by uh, relatively minor but p political party reform in Bishkek, and there is a, um, um, right, uh, the two other dimensions that I think might be interesting in this is that the Kyrgyz government is also asking for a fund, a $200 million annual fund, and now I don't really know, maybe there are others here who know more about this than I do, but for some, essentially some kind of assistance throughout to, to cushion the blow of this for the economy. There's also very interesting implications for migrants as well, labor migrants in particular, because again, we might be able to talk about this with others, but as I understand, Russia is going to demand that Kyrgyz will need international passports as of 2015. Now, again, this is a, some things I've read and I haven't been able to confirm, so I, I would actually not like to be quoted on that. Um, but it would be worth investigating what Russia plans in terms of requirements from labor migrants. And the point here is that customs unions members would be exempt from this. Um, again, I don't know if that's going to happen. There's a, often a lot of talk around what happens or will happen with, with migrants, but, but that is something that I, I have noted and, and have read about. So I think it's, a, it's generally really important to think about the role of these bazaars, the role of la labor migrants, and the political processes that are unfolding. And I, I do know that there are trade associations and lobbies that certainly have the backing of these bazaar owners to get these special preferential agreements. Um, the next big meeting that you'll want to keep your eye out for apparently is a March meeting of the Eurasian Economic Council in which more of this will be decided. Apparently something was drafted in the fall but Kyrgyzstan did not agree or s sign on. Um, if I think of anything else along those lines I'll let you know but that's what I have. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, yes. 
And next, David. Uh, <laughs> anthropology and uh, series. Uh, thank you for a great talk. And I'm interested to uh, get a little bit more from you on the ethnic implications of the bazaars, mm -hmm. given that there have been ethnic tensions yes. inside of Kyrgyzstan. A uh, fairly predictable question. I did notice that you said some of the owners are mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily Kyrgyz, that they can be uh, Uyghur and and it was back, but how does that play out and how does it play out in terms of their ability to handle what is clearly an inter-ethnic tension problem? Absolutely, yes, thank you for your question. I guess I'll answer both with regard to the Uyghur and the Uzbek. The Uzbek story is really quite tragic. Um, there are, uh, there were a number of prominent bazaar owners in the South, especially either at Karasu or the Osh Bazaar in Osh, who, um, were ethnic Uzbek. And after the events in 2010, um, they have either fled, from my understanding, fled the country, or actually are, are living in Bishkek or are not in the South anymore. Or if they're there, they're very much under the radar. So those events absolutely, I think, did result in um, a property struggle that resulted in the loss of, of property. Um, I do think that some of them probably still have some stakes, not only in the bazaars in Karasu, but also Dordoy, but it's not discussed. I mean, it's really not a topic that I could access. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you on that, but it's, it's definitely um, a very important and difficult subject. Um, with regard to the Uyghurs, it's interesting because this third bazaar I mentioned, Medina Bazaar, is the bazaar for apparel, fabrics, and all goods, all goods related to sewing. So buttons, machines, sewing machines, anything you would need to sew, you would find at Medina. And the owner is a Uyghur. Um, and there are many Uyghurs who do work at that bazaar. Um, he is now also an MP as of 2010. It's interesting, when I was there in the 2000s, he wasn't. And then after 2010, he has become an MP. And I think that this bazaar has experienced a particular resurgence, uh, or a particular growth in light of the booming sewing industry. Many of the producers we talked to when we asked them where do they get their goods, almost all of them said Medina Bazaar. So it really is the hub. For the, for the sewing sector. And it, and it seems to me that those types of, that issue with the Uyghurs is, uh, I met a Uyghur um, association official in the 2000s, and I can't say it was, it was totally a um, conflict-free kind of impression that I got, but it seemed much more, I, I don't even know what the right word is, um, maybe, um, appropriate or even accepted to talk about Uyghurs and the fact that Uyghurs live in this particular area, that they um, work in this bazaar. And there did not seem to be, um, th I mean, there have been some conflicts, but it didn't seem to be at the same level as the tensions with, with Uzbeks, especially in the south of the country. So thanks for the question. David? Yes, um, I'm, I'm David Abramson. I work at the State Department, a Central Asia analyst. And um, one, my question uh, for you is what, one, one lens, one way of uh, thinking about politics, the political mm -hmm. system and in, in economic system in, in Kyrgyzstan is this sort of patronage pyramid mm -hmm. um, which, in which uh, people at the top strive to control the major uh, sources of revenue mm -hmm. um, that come into the country or, or somehow are, are created in the country. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, two of those sources uh, have been the one surrounding the Manas Transit Center yep. um, and another one are the mines, as mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier. Yep. Um, and, then, and then there's this more sort of elusive uh, re-exporting um, business, which mm -hmm. is you know much more diffuse. Right. Um, but the noises that President Atambayev has been making recently, um, first of all, the U.S. is leaving the Manas Transit Center, so that mm -hmm. revenue is, is going. 
Yes. Um, there's been a lot of disturbances and protests surrounding mines, not only Kumtor, but other ones as yes, well. Yes, absolutely. Jeroy and uh, Australian owned, or partially Australian owned and other ones. Um, and, and then uh, noises about joining the customs union, which I, as you pointed out, and I w would tend to think that these are just negotiating ploys and you never know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't serve, as you pointed out, the, the bizarre uh, industry very well. So in a way you, you're left with saying, well, all of this is going away, what's left? Mm. But you're, um, and I'm still wrapping my head around your, um, what you were starting to talk about, this reconceptualizing the state in Kyrgyzstan, that there's, there are other things going on there. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just wondering um, if you could address it in from that, that, that patronage pyramid uh, lens as, and what, how was the alternative idea of the state uh, replacing that, working, you know, complementarily, I, you know, just uh, if you could uh, okay. address that. Yeah, great, thank you. I, I think I actually heard two questions, which is this patronage pyramid, what's going on there, and also the economic question of, of kind of what's left, right? So with regard to the patronage, I think 2010 was, was important because after 20 years where you had really very controlling presidential families, right? First Akayev and then Bakiev. You have a different system that emerges after 2010 with parties um, and essentially more decentralized control and struggles over um, power. And I think in that context, um, instead of having one clear centralized vertical line, there are multiple multiple nodes, I guess I would say. And I think that feeds nicely into the argument that I was trying to make about a more fragmented um, familial state where, yes, Atambayev's the president, but there are many other nodes if you un kind of peel the onion off of that major layer. Um, and, and for example, look at these at the ministries, who controls them and, and what the relationships in parliament are and, and what the family business looks like. That's essentially how I see the state emerging. So it's, it's more fragmented, for sure. I, I don't doubt that there are still patronage lines that are important and that are flowing, but it's certainly not as centralized or, or hierarchical as I think it used to be. Um, with regard to what's left, Right, so everyone talks about Manas, um, the fact that it's maybe coming to an end, and, and the gold protests. And the gold protests are very, very, very interesting. Um, it's, it's, it's much more, as you said, than just Kumtor. Right? There are many mining operations and interests. Um, I don't know if you've seen the new, there's a, a new report that the OSCE Academy put out, and I would actually love to give a plug to David Goulet. I just read it. It's, it's right here. It's a big, long report, and it's on conflict sensitivity in the mining sector, and they actually do a couple of really fantastic case studies of mining protests. Um, again, not to, to take this, in part to take the spotlight off come tour, but also to look at the really challenging property relations, business relations, and community relations that are all, as well as politics and patronage and the fact that some of these protests are kind of controlled or instigated by certain intermediaries that have political interests, right? So all of that is, is going on in the context of kind of contradictory subsoil land rights and mining laws. Um, so in some cases, it's a perfect example of the ways in which property and a, a lack of um, formal rule of law institutions is manifesting itself. But on the other hand, you know, yes, there have been challenges to Kumtor and these other groups, but they've still managed to continue to operate. And I, in fact, in the book manuscript, have some quotes from investors who essentially say the same thing. Like, you, you, you have to be able to negotiate, you have to build your ties at the local level especially, and you have to be able to adapt. And sometimes that does mean giving up um, shares and renegotiation, re renegotiating contracts. But if you look at the history of mining and oil and gas, renegotiating contracts is part and parcel of, of the history of the relationship between foreign investors and local resources. So. Um, 
that's one thing that came to mind in the context of, of the discussion about gold and protests. But I think more generally, what, I'm try what I am trying to do is take the spotlight off of gold and Manas and look at bazaars. I think migrants is another place to look. And, and I think these are more decentralized forms of capital inflows. So Kiran Chowdhury works in the Middle East, and she has this fascinating contrast between remittances coming into Yemen and oil money coming into Saudi Arabia and how those different capital flows do impact politics, political systems, and the state in very different ways. Right? The remittances are very decentralized. Um, bazaars are interesting because at the level of the trade it is, but at the level of ownership it aggregates up again. Um, but I do think it's still a relatively independent source of wealth that continues to, I guess the argument tying it back to the familial state, is it continues to allow these nodes, these nodes of power, these um, f this fragmented network of families to sustain themselves. Now, if, if Russia does insist on the customs, or I shouldn't say that, if, um, <laughs> if Kyrgyzstan joins the customs union, let's just say that. Um, um, and again, you know, I don't know enough about the behind the scenes uh, of what's going on, so I, I really am hesitant to use particular language, but if, if it does, if it is the case that Kyrgyzstan joins, I do think that will have a significant impact on the bazaars. I do think, though, that there may be opportunities to adapt, um, because we have seen it before. When the borders have closed in the past, they adapt. Um, what it will look like, uh, it will be more challenging, um, but it, it may, for example, for the producers of clothing, they, they may actually be able to benefit from that. Yeah. OK, a lot of questions. Wow. Um, I'll go over here, and then I'll go back over here. Um, my name is Ann Johnson. I am a student uh, in the Global Human Development Program um, of the School of Foreign Service. And right. sort of following up on the question about ethnic inclusion and exclusion, mm -hmm. I have a question about gender inclusion. Yes. Um, the folks that you mentioned seem to be mostly men in, mm -hmm. in the management positions, but in, mm -hmm. in the photos that you're showing, and also in my experience yes. in Central Asia, women mm -hmm. are very active in bizarre yes. culture. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder what you found in terms of women's ability to be a part of, you know, these economic negotiations and mm -hmm. property titles and, and sort of roles as buyers and sellers in management. Uh, what, what did you find and what are the implications for that for sort of the continued growth of these bazaars? Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, the gender dimension is really important. And, um, and I do think that as you're seeing in these pictures, most of the traders and people who work in bazaars are women. Um, and that is... Um, that has been the case and that continues to be the case. Um, it's not exclusive. So, for example, if you do go to the Car and Spare Parts Bazaar, you will find mostly men. And, how, and it, was, it was a funny story about I, I was walking there with another student, a woman, and we got all sorts of, you know, in Kyrgyz or Kazakh, aren't you at the wrong bazaar? <laughs> um, so it's not exclusively the case, but by and large it is. Um, and, and it is true that most of the owners are men. However, the women do play important roles in, at the level of owners because oftentimes the women are formally the owners of the business because the husband is, for example, the member of parliament or is in a political position where he's technically not allowed to have uh, a business, let's say. So I'm thinking of, you know, Baibolov and his wife, or um, Sabirov and his wife, right? These teams, these husband-wife teams. Um, Danyar Usyanov and his wife, right? There are many husband-wife teams that are very, very prominent. It's also very interesting that you have some women in parliament now, in part because of the quota system. So now you have a certain percentage of women that have to be in parliament after the 2010 reforms. Some of them are um, independent, I would say, you know, either politically active on their own or um, have emerged on their own. But if, if you do look closely, some of them are wives of important people, whether it's the wife of um, Daniel Rosenov, who is an important figure, or even the wife of people who have been killed in the 2000s in the context of various property redistributions, um, 
I can name names if you want, but there are some individuals that, um, women, who are continuing these bigger business legacies through positions in parliament. Um, I don't think that fully answers your question. I think there are really big implications for the role of women, uh, much more from a sociological perspective in terms of the role of the family, the role of being the primary breadwinner. This is very much true in the apparel sector too. There are many, many women who started these shops. Um, and they often do work with their husbands as teams. They run the shop, but the husband might be the taxist. You know, he might be the driver. Or the husband might um, uh, be a seller um, or an intermediary. So I would say the women do play an important role. It's also really important to look at the families and the role that the families are playing, either at the level of traders or even at the level of owners. Um, and, and, and I can also point you afterwards to some other work that... Um, for example, Gul Gulberna Ozan has done on, on women and gender in the bazaars. So it's a great question. Thank you. Okay, let's go over here. I'll maybe take three this way. Okay. Henry. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Henry Hale, uh, GW. Uh, yeah, so thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about how um, you know, these uh, bazaar owners and their networks negotiate mm -hmm. the various uh, revolutionary moments that Kyrgyzstan mm, has experienced, mm -hmm. the transitions to new patrons or to, you know, kind of a new system of arrangement of kind of the, the power at the top. Um, I'd just be interested in your thoughts about how the strategies, you know, is it the same strategy that continues all along and basically ensures them against all this or is mm -hmm. there kind of extra adaptation that has to take place and how do they, you know, are they anticipating these things? Anyway, I'd just be interested in your thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have to say I've looked more at the 2005 changes than um, at the 2010 changes, but I think it, um, unfortunately, I wish I could give you a overarching unified answer. But I think the reality of the empirics is it's that it's messier than that. So if we take um, Salam Bekov, say, his strategy, I think, going into 2005 and after was definitely, I think because of your work and what you've talked about with the lame duck phenomenon and the idea that people kind of knew that Akayev was on his way out, I think he actively pursued that member of parliament seat as insurance in a certain sense to... Uh, because of the uncertainty of, of who was coming and, and this idea that already at the time the, the position in the parliament had, had, for business people had become important, an important um, uh, secure, source of security, I guess, for business. Um, at the same time, however, he was not a leader, for example, in any of the major protest movements that you saw at the time. Um, some of the people who gained the most prominent attention at the time, so if you remember like Bayaman Erkenbayev or Sura Baldiev, both of whom were bazaar owners, one um, a bazaar in the south, the other the current spare parts bazaar, they were sportsmen turned bandits turned businessmen. And so they, and, and I have a section on this, they actually, I think, played an important instigating role. I mean, you can't say that they caused the revolution, but they were right there in the front and center of it um, as the events were unfolding in 2005. And um, they were from this very particular Soviet-era group, I think, um, that, that was more inclined to use violence. Um, I do think that, uh, so more broadly on how they negotiate revolutionary moments, I think it's interesting to note that many of them sought to continue their MP status after 2010 as well. So they essentially reformed new bargains in the context of that parliamentary election. There's a lot of um, discussion about how much people paid to get on which party list. Um, but I think that is in a certain sense a continuity of, of the system and not a change. Um, it's a continuity um, in, in, in signaling the importance of this status for continued business and property relations. Um, uh, so I think that's what I would, I would say to your answer. Thanks for your question. Okay, yes, Dan. First of all, thank you, Regine. It's always a joy to hear you talking about something that I know you have a passion for. <laughs> Second, lest I forget, Dina Shulk sends her regards, yes. and for those people that don't know, Dina is a Georgetown student mm -hmm. who got a Fulbright and is studying the bazaars in Kyrgyzstan as we're sitting here. Uh, her one comment to me in the last email, it is very, very cold. Yes. 
-hmm. the, what you, the process you described reminds me of something that I saw in Eastern Europe in mm -hmm. the early 1990s, where a market, especially uh, the one I'm thinking of is in Warsaw, developed, yes. and the traders would come in with goods from Germany if they made the right decisions, they would evolve from the little containers to full stands, and then eventually you see them move out into mm -hmm. stores in the city. And oh, the, the embassy used to say, "This is, you know, they're learning, you know, capitalism." Uh, if they made the wrong decisions, then they ended up down in the swamp where the Russians were coming in and selling used lot of parts. So, you know, there was a way of evolving. What you're describing here, do you ever see any of the traders? get to the point mm -hmm. that they can become bazaar owners or has the system become stratified that the owners continue to be owners, the traders continue to be traders, in which case it's a way of making a living, but it's not a way of social advancement. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. I'm going to answer it in two ways. I actually heard part of the question about modernization to stores, um, and I heard part of the question as um, transitioning, let's say, from traders to owners. And I think more broadly, this issue of, of class is very interesting to think about. I think it's generally under-theorized in the region um, today. And I've been trying to th think about this, actually. Um, I do think that there's a fairly large divide between the traders and the owners at the top, and that the owners really do embody a separate class, I guess I would say if I had to use that word, definitely socioeconomic status. That's not to say, however, that the traders don't feel like they're moving up, per se. Um, I'm not sure that they would use the same language that we use in terms of middle class. But when we interv when we t I talked to them and when we interviewed, for example, these apparel producers, we, we asked them specific questions to get at this without using this language. So for example, were you able to buy a car because of your business? Were you able to buy a house? Were you a do you go on vacation? And, and the answer is often yes to, to most of those questions. The question of oh, buying a home is, is a little harder because it is more expensive. But um, I think... I think my general impression from many of, especially the, the people who work at the bigger bazaars, now this is not the case for the women who work at the very small local bazaars, um, and, and to be totally honest, I haven't done as much work on those, I focus more on the bigger um, bazaars at, and hubs, um, is that there is a, a dynamic here where they do feel like um, um, they may not be moving up to the class of a bazaar owner, but they're able to do things now that um, but that, that might, from our perspective of what the middle class maybe looks like, might consider, um, like, let's say, leisure or various forms of property ownership might look like the middle class. Now, you have to put that in local context because we're not talking about the same <laughs> kind of money. Um, but in terms of how people perceive what, they've be, what they're able to do, I think it is changing. On the question of modernization in stores, um, I, I have been in touch with Dina as well, so it's nice to hear from her. Um, and she's actually working in um, a big bazaar in, in Almaty, Kazakhstan. This question of modernization is very interesting. It's very, very salient in Kazakhstan. It was salient in the mid-2000s when I was there. There was a very, very, very explicit discourse of modernization that was coming from the government. We need to modernize. We need to become civilized. We need to civilize this trade, this trade at the bazaars being perceived as uncivilized or um, un not modern. And so there was an active move, and there were a whole set of policies um, that I've actually written about that were attempted to be implemented to move these traders out of bazaars into stores, magazines, you know, malls. And, and now there are very big glitzy malls, right, in, in Almaty. To some extent, that has happened in Kazakhstan, and I think, be, I think the oil money here is, is, is crucial. I mean, there's just a different scale of an economy there than, let's say, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, that said, Baraholka and some of the other bazaars in Kazakhstan remain very active to this day. And when you talk to people, let's say you talk to people who work at restaurants, they say, well, where do you get your goods? Bazaar. You talk to consumers, especially the ones who don't have a lot of money, which are the, probably the majority. They say, oh yeah, we walk around in, in, in malls. We go there, but when we want to buy things, we go to the bazaar. So 
it's changing, especially in Kazakhstan, and there's definitely this discourse of modernization. I think essentially what the government realized, though, is that it's not only about modernization and civilizing the trade. It's about the fact these people have become invested in more ways than one, not only financially and economically, but professionally and in terms of their identity in this new business. Um, I started to look at microcredit, for example. You close down a bazaar, <laughs> your financial sector collapses too, right, if these people can't repay their loans. So it's much more complicated now, 20, 25 years later. And I think even now there are calls um, in, in the Amati government circles to close some of the bazaars, um, to modernize them. I think it's an incremental process. I think there's also behind the scenes very much property redistributions going on here. Um, there was a, a call for the closure of one of the major car and spare parts bazaars in Almaty, and what happened was that a new one opened 15 miles down the road that was in the hands of a presidential family member. So none of that, yeah, shocking, right? <laughs> but, um, but the politics of how that plays out um, is more complex, I guess, at the local level than, um, than you might, you know, imagine. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that the government can't just do that, right? There, there's this, this process and um, set of negotiations and stories and individuals, whether it's the mayor or a relative of, you know, that become involved in creating this narrative and making such things happen. Yes. yes. One more question. Perfect. Right here. Oh. Right. I'll talk after. May I? Bartosz Szydliński, yeah. visiting researcher at Ceres. I would like to ask about the list of MPs you mentioned. You know, because, Which list? Um, I have many. Not the list. In <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Namely, um, if you can see that economic or business competition uh, it is mm. com combined with the political struggle. Namely, if the economic interest you know, sometimes can be, you know, um, went to the politics, right? That <clears throat> fraction between some MPs oh, can yes. be easily seen you know, in future or even currently. I see. So you're asking about struggles between certain MP business people. Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> there, there definitely is. Yes, there definitely is. So even in this, in this Dordle Bazaar that I've talked about, initially early on it was a team. It was not only Selim Bekov, but another prominent official, former MP by Bolov, and they were um, classmates together. So this, you know, the history of classmates is very important. Um, and they started out together. They are no longer together, is my understanding. And so, yes, there are falling outs. Um, there are more violent confrontations, for example, with some of the people from the sports or criminal world. Um, but by and large, what's, what's really interesting is that I think the negotiations happen, um, and especially with the people that I've followed, you know, this Uyghur Bazaar, Selim Bekov, some of the other bazaar owners, um, with the exception of the, the, Uz, the ethnic Uzbeks in the South, I think there there was a major transformation after 2010. It's remarkably stable. To, again, to go back to my, <laughs> my theme, um, the, they've carved out their niches, and I think what you're seeing is they're trying to protect them through these different mechanisms now, um, and through this fragmented fusion of s s political and, and economic power. So I'd be happy to talk with you in more depth about these individual cases, but I think overall uh, there is significant continuity across time and in and, and these particular sectors. Yes, thanks. Very interesting discussion uh, informally. We have a reception waiting for you out there, and I'd like you to join me in thanking Regine for a very interesting and very informative talk. Thank you. Thank you.